All right, welcome back on this Friday. We appreciate you hanging out with us. We are Sports Day, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. The Gun, B. Brooks, R. Ellis. Always, always love the insights of our next guest. You can follow him on Twitter, at Shiel Kapadia. Does an amazing job with his podcasting and his writing for The Ringer. You've seen him all over the place. Uh, the Athletic, ESPN, Philly Mag back in the day, you name it. The one and only Shiel Kapadia. What's up, Shiel? Yeah, you're reminding me how old I am naming all these places I, I, I've worked. So we, we don't need to do that during the intro next time. <laughs> these, were internships. these were internships when you were in kindergarten, Shield. okay? That's right. There you just go. Just to be clear. Um, so we were just talking about this. I want to pick up on the conversation before we get into the, the Super Bowl matchup for a minute. But, Shield, you know, as a native of this area, that the Eagles have gone through crazy long stretches without winning. I mean – they went 57 years between championships. I need I say more, right? What we're seeing is very unique. The fact that they're back here five years later, I know it's under a different coach and, you know, quarterback, et cetera. Nonetheless, th this, this time period, and you can maybe date it back to Jeffrey Lurie taking over or whatever you want, but this is rarefied air for this organization. It really is. I spent kind of after they made, you know, won that NFC championship game, spent some time writing a column uh, for the ringer and thinking about it. Like the first 20 years of my life, it didn't happen, you know, and you thought it was going to happen. The last game of the vet uh, against Tampa, you thought it was going to happen the first year at the link against that Panthers team. And it didn't happen. And it felt I'm sure for many Eagles fans, like it was never going to happen. I mean, think about what it took for them to just get there in 2004 it, it took adding you know maybe the best wide receiver one of the three best wide receivers in the nfl to the mix to kind of have that special season and get there and so now to get there two times in six years i mean everybody watching listening to this you can live to 100 and like legitimately that might never happen again we're two times in six years the team you root for the team you pay money to get the gear and the tickets and hang out with friends and family all that hoping that just one of these years, you're going to be one of the last two teams standing to do that two times in six years. Um, yeah, it, it really is is special and kind of worth taking in for Eagles fans. Shield, what has impressed you the most about this entire journey that this Eagles team has been on this season? It, it's a good question because there's the known and, and the unknown, you know. So the known was going into the season just impressed with the, the pure talent. I mean, maybe the most talented team we've ever seen in our lifetimes uh, watching the Eagles or, or whatever. When you just look top to bottom, every position, looking for a weakness, the amount of all pros, that really stood out to me. But uh, aside from that, it's, it's got to be Jalen Hurts. I mean, that was the question. I'm pretty sure I was on with you guys, whether it was early in the season or before the season, and just saying – I don't know. It's going to be one of three things. Either he's going to play great and they're going to have a magical season and he's going to get rewarded with the big contract or he's going to play solid, but maybe not spectacular like we saw last year. And they're going to be a good team, but you're still going to go into the offseason saying, what's the answer a quarterback? What are you doing a quarterback? Or he's going to regress, which I think, you know, that, that was always the least likely scenario, but within the range of outcomes. So the way he kind of just continues to improve and become sort of, the face of the franchise. Like there was a clip in the locker room, uh, I think after last game where Brandon Graham is addressing the team and he says, you know, like Jalen says, and I'm like, man, think of everything Brandon Graham has seen in his career. I had hair when Brandon Graham was first playing <laughs> for the Eagles. Like this guy has been through the ups and downs, the coaching changes, the lows of lows. And now this guy, the longest tenured Eagle, when he's addressing the team after they make the Super Bowl, he's referencing what the second year starting quarterback is saying. I mean, I, I think that really speaks to kind of that connection, uh, that leadership that Jalen Hurts has shown this season. Mm. Well, Shill, man, we know how great Andy is, man. Does does this coaching staff have enough? You know what I'm saying? As far as coaching, you know, because we, we know we have the better roster. Eagles have the better roster. To me, they have the better roster. Best roster in the NFL. Does Nick have enough to outdo one of the greatest? Yeah, I was thinking about the difference between this Eagles team and the 2017 team. And now that we've had time to reflect, like the 2017 team, I put more on like, what an incredible coaching job. I mean, you, you compare position by position to this team. It's like, man, you know, they, this team has the edge talent wise. Uh, and, and so I agree with you there that they have the edge talent wise against the chiefs. And then you go back to Andy. I mean, my line has been, and I, I don't know if you guys think this is fair or unfair. Uh, I would give Andy the edge from sort of today until 
Sunday at 640 or whenever kickoff mm-hmm. is. Yep. But for those three and a half hours, I think I might give the edge to the Eagles coaching staff because it's gone under the radar. But Nick Sirianni's game management has been outstanding this year. I mean, try mm-hmm. to think of the instances where they've screwed up the clock at the end of the half or at the end of the game using timeouts, uh, all those different things, when to go for two, when to go for it on fourth down, not getting the play calls in. Like, you know, you look at some of these teams around the league, it's, it's three times a game, the quarterback's going over to the coach saying, get the play call in, and then you waste a timeout. Like, all that stuff, to Nick Sirianni's credit, he's done a brilliant job managing these games. So you never how, know how the nerves and the stage, um, you know, are going to affect a guy. But we all know for as great as Andy Reid is and a Hall of Fame coach and one of the greatest coaches in the last uh, 25 years, that is still his weakness, in, in my opinion. Those in-game situations where you have to figure it out on the fly. What are we doing right now? How are we going to adjust? Now, I think Patrick Mahomes has sort of taken that out of Andy Reid's hands because he's really good at that too. So mm-hmm. you'll see him just waving off the sidelines saying, don't worry, I got this. I know when we need a timeout. But just that's something I've got my eye on in the Super Bowl is sort of those little things uh, in terms of clock management, timeout usage, getting the plays in. Like yeah. Smitty. Yeah, Smitty. Get, getting right. right up and telling They them, practice yeah. that. They practice 100%. that. 100%. I mean, he didn't waste a second, right? There was mm-hmm. a signal. They, they had a mic'd up with Devontae Smith. I don't know if you guys saw, and they kind of bleeped that part out because I'm pretty sure they've got a word that, hey, when you need everyone to hustle up, yell this word, everyone communicate that word, everyone get up to the yep. line of scrimmage, and he was on top of it. So that they are a smart, well-coached team, no doubt about it. Shield, that's a great point because I think because Nick is so uh, emotional and, and you know wears his heart on his sleeve and, and you know boisterous sometimes and, and, and all those other things, and I don't mean that – that's not negative to me. That's He's genuine. But because of that, I think sometimes the way he runs this thing gets overlooked. They're prepared every week, man. You know, every single week. You're right. In game, it's all it's been almost flawless this year. I mean, I just think watching what Kyle Shanahan did last week, watching Mike McCarthy, you, you know, the last couple few years, whatever, you see these guys who can't handle it. So, something goes haywire during yeah. the game. That's never the case with Nick. As emotional mm-hmm. as he might get when it comes to decision making, man, he's right on. And I think it even goes back to last year when he gives up the play calling. Like, that helps. I mean, some of these coaches, they just want to do everything. Yeah, I've got the play calling. Don't worry. Wide receiver's unhappy coming off the field. I'll handle that. I went to call time. You can't handle everything. Like, it's hard. It's a high-stress environment. You're on the clock. And so uh, I, th- I think that was smart by Nick Sirianni to give that up uh, last year, kind of show that humility to give that up. And now you can focus uh, on some of the other stuff for sure. Shil, we've talked about this throughout the week, and – you know, you look at the journey that this team has taken this year. It didn't start this year. It started in 2021 when Howie sat there and admitted in front of us that he needed to do a better job of listening to outside, um, you know, more so than thinking he was the smartest guy in the room. And I think that speaks volumes in terms of a person growing, you know, even as for as long as he'd been tenured with his organization, you know, you never, you should never stop growing as a person. And it took him a little bit longer, maybe than it should have. But the bottom line is he learned his lesson well. And lo and behold, look at where we are right now. Yeah, there, there were definitely fractures uh, in that building, uh, you know, in, in 2020, when you're looking at, uh, and, and I've done re- reporting on this for the athletic, just when you look at coaching staff and front office, and they had to move the analytics department from one side of one part of the building to another side of the building because there was clashing uh, there. And so everybody wasn't on the same page. There was, you know, some confusion about, well, if Howie's making the final pick, uh, you know, these final say on these draft picks, like, is our input being valued? Because we don't know what this department said. We don't know what he was the only one who had all the answers, him and Jeffrey Lurie, who had all the information from all these different departments that work together. And so I, I think, you know, maybe after 2020, maybe after uh, that thing ended with Doug Peterson and that coaching staff, they said going forward, we have some improvements to make. And listen, I, I don't know specifically what's changed, how much has changed how long lasting it is. It's always tough when a team's winning like this, everyone's hugging and, you know, Mm -hmm. everyone's feeling good. And then the next year, if you go seven and 10, then all of a sudden it changes right away. But I think you're right. I mean, just the moves they've made the last two years, like really for Howie, this is kind of an unprecedented rebuild to go where they are in 2020 and to get, have to get off that Carson Wentz contract to now Mm -hmm. all of a sudden have the most talented roster uh, in the NFL. There's no doubt he's pushed, 
uh, a lot of the right buttons for sure. Mm. Shield, let, let me ask you <clears throat> if just from the game itself, um, what areas would concern you most from an Eagle standpoint? I, I know the obvious is Mahomes and that kind of thing, but what would worry you if you're an Eagles fan about this matchup? Well, the hardest thing with Mahomes, and I'm working on a piece now that'll be up on uh, the ringer on Monday, and I'm just lo- I'm trying to look at every angle of Mahomes. Is there a weakness? And my goodness, you look at him versus man, him versus zone, him versus single high safety, him versus split safety, him versus one, two, one. Like, that's where he ranks among every starting quarterback in every category. So uh, that, that is the challenge for this defensive coaching staff. I mean, I, I think if you're the Eagles, obviously – He's the number one, uh, number one issue there, and it's obvious to say, but it's just so hard to game plan against him and know what buttons uh, to push there to just kind of keep him in check because even his worst games are like an average game for a normal starting quarterback yeah. in the mm-hmm. NFL. Like the guy really does not uh, have bad games. So um, you have a lot of decisions to make on that side of the ball. And then on the other side of the ball, I, I think you have to have a plan for Chris Jones. I mean, that, that sounds obvious, but really, if you look at the talent the Chiefs have defensively, like he's number one, and he'll line up in, a, in different spots. I mean, he had a big sack against the Bengals late where he's lined up at defensive end against their right tackle, smokes the guy, sacks Burrow on third down, and, and he's the best. Um, you know, Aaron Donald being injured this year, Chris Jones is the best interior pass rusher in the NFL. So um, you have those certain people that you kind of identify uh, on the chiefs and say, you know, when you start the game plan, this is who you need to game plan for. And Chris Jones is at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concerns with how the office has been running the last two weeks? We haven't got our, uh, our two main receivers uh, (coughs) involved in it, but we bone the teams out. Is there any concern that uh, there's something wrong with it or, or, you know, are they just, they don't have to use it right now. Yeah, I have some concerns with how they finished the season. And at first I thought that was uh, offensively specifically. At first I kind of thought uh, that was overblown and it still might be. But if you just kind of look at their uh, offensive performances since Jalen Hurts got back from the injury, and it's been a little wonky because week 18 – you have like a preseason game plan. So I don't want to put too much into it, but certainly that was not a great offensive performance. And then you have the, uh, the divisional round there against the Giants where you play pretty well. And then you have this game against the Niners where it was a real grind offensively. And to your point, <coughs> excuse me, uh, excuse me, got a little su- all this talking. I'm not, I'm not used to it. Uh, <laughs> the downfield passing game has not been there in recent weeks and so that to me is certainly a concern and something you have to get back on track here and you're going to have to take advantage of those young corners uh on the Chiefs. so that that's something else that in recent weeks hasn't been there it's got to be there in the super bowl shill how much of it do you think is just health how much of it is dictated by the fact that let's face it these games weren't all that close you you didn't really have to throw a ton you know, in the second half of the Giants game and and, or the 49ers game, you know, when you look at, I'm just talking about from a passing game perspective, you know, and and Jalen will tell you, he's been pretty frank. I'm not right. I'm, I'm, I'm battling through it. I'll be okay. I'm playing in the Super Bowl, whatever. But, but how much of it is, is just circumstances of games where they've been, you know, had pretty sizable leads too. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, you look at the circumstances, it's what you said. And then also the Niners have the best defense in the NFL. So I've been playing this game, you know, with myself here in the last few days saying how much stock to put into it because you have the Niners had the best defense in the NFL. You played well against the Giants in uh, the divisional round. Week 18, you had a preseason game plan. It didn't really matter. So there are these varying circumstances. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if they came out and played really well uh, offensively in the Super Bowl. But to, to Barrett's point there, yeah, the passing game, has looked a little more uneven, whereas early in the season, it felt so easy, right? You would sit down, watch these games, and go, what doesn't every offense do? They're just going right down the field uh, (laughs) with these, doing whatever they want, and it hasn't been the case for like the last month or so. So you're right, Rob. There's been certain circumstances about why that's been the case, and the Chiefs don't have a great defense. Like, I would put them middle of the pack, but Steve Spagnuolo, his kind of calling card throughout his career is he can put together a great game plan for one week in the playoffs where you say, you know what, throw all the stats from the whole season out the window. He knows how to attack this specific team specifically uh, when given 
two weeks. So uh, I'm giving you a wishy-washy answer because I don't know. It's something mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out what the level of concern should be uh, for the offense because I really could see it going either way where if they lose the game, we look back and say, well, yeah, you know, you, we should have seen that coming. They weren't that clean the last month of the season. And if they come out and move the ball and play great, say, well, there was a reason why they didn't move the ball. They were right back to being the team we all thought they were. Mm-hmm. Shio, we are still nine days away from kickoff. But as we sit here right now, and, and, and your writing wheels are spinning, what are, what are your biggest what, your one biggest storyline for each team right now? I think the biggest story of the game is the Eagles' pass rush against the, uh, mm-hmm. against the Chiefs' offensive line. I mean, really, I'm going to spend a lot of words talking and writing over the next nine days. I could probably just give that piece of analysis, and I feel very strongly that by the time Sunday night rolls around, that's going to be the story of the game. I mean, this Eagles defense, their pass rush, I mean, not even eight deep. We're talking like 10 deep rotating guys in and out. They're healthy. They sack opposing quarterbacks, I think, 11% of the time. It's like the highest rate in the last 20 years of any team in the NFL. And then you have a magician on the other side where if you watch these games, when they have it, the Chiefs have issues up front, Mahomes makes it right. Like he knows how to move. He knows how to maneuver. He has this, you know, we we talk about the arm angles and the throwing all the time, but just like the spatial awareness of he knows what, like he has something in his head where he knows where every player on the field is at all times. So uh, to me, that's really, you know, going to be the biggest, uh, the biggest story in this game. And certainly from a chief's perspective, I mean, I'm sure Andy Reid is looking at this going, we're not going to let their pass rush wreck this game. Cause we know what happened in the Super Bowl two years ago. They totally remade their entire team after that. And I think he's going to say, no, that's not happening uh, th- th- this time around. So that's number one on that end. And then on the other end, it- it's probably what we already talked about. Like I'm not expecting the Eagles defense to shut down the chiefs. Their offense is going to have to play their a game. And so, it's that thought of how do you attack these Chiefs? How are the Chiefs going to play out? So, I mean, it might be as simple as you can run the ball on them all day long and you can mix in the RPOs if you want to. But, man, you should have an edge with the way your offensive line has been playing with Jalen Hurts having uh, two weeks of rest with that shoulder. You really should be able to run the football on them uh, in this game. Mm. Let me ask you this. Um, what do you contribute – the rise of Kenneth Gainwell being, you know, he's, he's not right now. He's splitting reps. They have even reps the last two games um, going into this. You know, do you think that continues and what makes him just look so good right now in the playoffs? He's this year's Corey Clement. It feels that way. I don't know if you guys have made the same great comparison. comparison. Yeah, yeah, not, absolutely. But yeah. Can I use that? <laughs> yeah, no, steal it. I stole it from someone else, Barry. Right. So I, I, don't know, I don't even know who to credit it to uh, at this at this point, whoever said it first. But I, I thought it was really accurate because yeah. I don't think any of us watching this team during the season in week 12, week 14, were saying Kenny Gainwell needs more touches. I mean, I, I don't remember that conversation uh, really happening. And then all of a sudden you watch the playoffs. Like you said, they're splitting snaps and it's warranted. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, should it, that be the case? in the Super Bowl, 100%. And I think not only is Gainwell running it well, but as a receiver, and it sort of felt this way for most of the season, when you look at third down, uh, it feels like they trust him more on third down, whether that's blitz pickup, whether that's his, his route running. But they had, I think it was a third and five in that game against the Niners. He leaks out into the flat. Jalen Hurts gets in the ball, makes a linebacker miss runs through a tackle, 17-yard gain by the time he gets out of bounds. So uh, I think he's going to be a factor for sure in this game. And, uh, yeah, I, w- I would expect him to continue to play well. He- he's really been doing a good job recently. Let-, let me follow up on what Barrett just started because I want to hear from all three of you on this, me going to the well of conspiracy theories again. Maybe Gainwell is getting more touches so the organization – can help decide do they need to keep Miles Sanders? Are they okay moving on from Sanders Stop, based Jerry. on uh, hey, hey, on, it's man. a it's a uh, why not Oliver Stone? Why right. Not? Why not why think about it now? Let's wait think two weeks from now. No, think about <laughs> it. Think about it. And and we can see this unfold in the in the Super Bowl game as well. They've got to make decisions. We've been talking about this for months. Maybe this is a part of helping them make a decision for the immediate future. 
Nobody wants to touch I mean, that one. <laughs> no, yeah, I wasn't sure. You, well, bear, bear. I mean, I would be surprised at this stage if that was like a if this were happening in like week seven or eight. I would say, okay, yeah, I could, you know, maybe that is part of it. Now, you know, the the coaching staff, if you're kind of going to them with that, you know, Nick Sirianni, we said is a fiery guy. I think it would be like, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the guy in who's gonna get more in the Super Bowl. Who's gonna give me the best chance to win? I don't care what we do in the off season with Miles Sanders' contract, but it could be an effect of that. Uh, Gunner, I, I think I don't think it's the motivation, but could it be the effect of that where Gainwell plays well again, Miles Sanders hits the open market, and you say, all right, Gainwell, maybe we sign a veteran for the minimum, maybe we draft someone in the fifth round and do kind of a running back by committee because you have to feel better, much better about Gainwell now than maybe you did uh, eight weeks ago. So, uh, you know, I, I could see that being effect, an effect of it for sure. Sheila, were you concerned when the Eagles signed Reddick that they weren't going to necessarily use him the right way? We saw early in his career that he wasn't used the right way. Um, did that concern you? I, because I know you had some concerns about Gannon in general, but th- that did that worry you? Yeah, you know, I, I think I was, you know, my line was that, uh, like, Reddick tells you how good the defensive coordinator is because he's been in different schemes, and there have been times where he hasn't played well, they haven't used him well, and then there have been other times – where he has played well. So I think one, Gannon deserves credit for that. But two, I would say Reddick is not like, I don't want to, I don't know if limited is the right word, but you look at his market, like he got 15 million for a year, uh, which is a nice number. But you look at some of the other pass rushers in the NFL who have his sack production, who are his age, and they're making, you know, two, three, four million more than that. And so I think there was this thought around the league, and this isn't the first time he's been a free agent, by the way. So I think there was this thought around the league about, yeah, you know, he doesn't fit every scheme. You have to use him the right way. And honestly, if you watch his film, he can line up against the right tackle and kick that guy's butt consistently. Like, you don't – like, yeah, you can stunt him, and he's great doing stuff like that, and you can move him around. You can also line him up there, and he has shown he can kill that guy, like destroy that guy. He's done that time and again. And so uh, I think he's probably opened some eyes not only with the Eagles – but league wide, like, no, I'm not a limited player who needs to be in a perfect scheme and you need to draw a place for me to get to the quarterback. Let me line up there. And my sort of pass rush arsenal has expanded and I can just win my one on one. So, uh, I mean, the guy's been incredible. 19 and a half sacks in 19 games. And uh, the line, you know, I've been saying these aren't like Jason Babbitt uh, type sacks, you know, where you look at the, <laughs> the box score at the end of the year and go, wait, he had how many sacks this year? No, these are you're watching the game and at the end of the game, you're going, well, I know Hassan Reddick had a major impact because he made X number of game changing plays. So he's a big factor in this game because you look at that chief's offensive line, great in the interior, maybe one of the best two or three guard center guards in the NFL. You look at tackle. They're not, I'm not going to say they're bad or terrible or anything like that, but that's kind of where the weakness is uh, where you can get to them a little bit. So whether it's Reddick, Josh sweat or, or Brandon Graham, I think, you know, one of those guys has to be heard from in the Super Bowl for the Eagles to, to produce some negative plays. All right, I'll put, I'll put my address in the private chat, okay? <laughs> and you can send me that Jordan uh, plaque in your back, bro. Yeah, I'll good luck. Right. <laughs> good luck. No shot. You know, it's uh, hot, man. Just let you know it's hot, man. It's no, hot. I love you. Yeah, the Shield's <laughs> backdrop's cool. Very cool. Um, I'll tell you the other advantage, Shield, they got all 22 starters, man. How I mean, that's insane how healthy they are. And that's the other thing, you know, we all, all of us, what are they doing in the preseason? What's happening here? Maintenance days, this and that. Every team around the league is like, how is this even possible? Just ask San Francisco, who was down four quarterbacks last week. It's Walk unbelievable. on Wednesday? What? Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's really unheard of, 22 starters by the time you get to this point in the season. I mean, I haven't looked back and seen how many teams have had that, but – you know, it's really kind of the underlying thing in the NFL where we, again, we spend all these hours, words with all our analysis. And usually when you look at who's not every year, but usually when you look at who's in the Super Bowl, you say, wow, those teams had kind of the best injury luck of any team in the NFL this season. It, it, it really uh, matters. And so, yeah, they're in a great spot. The Chiefs got a little banged up in that AFC championship game. So keep an eye on that injury report as we go in to next week. But the Eagles, it's like, Unless somebody gets, you know, gets injured in practice with, you know, it'll knock on wood. You don't want to see anything like that happen. But unless something like that happens, they're going into this game ready to play anyone and everyone they need to. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no question. Sheila, what's your feel, man? I know we're nine out here, right? It's not – you usually dig a little bit deeper as we get into the next week, but you got a vibe right now at least of, of where this thing could go here with the game? Yeah, I, I've been flip-flopping. Honestly, I, I'm leaning a li- leaning Eagles right now just because, you know, to, to what Barrett said initially. Like, you go position by position, and, man, you're putting a lot of checks in the Eagles column just in terms of better corners, better wide receivers, better O-line better D line. I mean, there's only, you know, a handful of places you would say, give the chiefs the edge. And then I remind myself, one of those places is that quarterback who, uh, you know, 20 years from now, we might be saying that's, that's the greatest guy we ever saw uh, play football. The greatest quarterback we've ever seen. He's in his prime. And in my head, I'm going, are they going to go five years with Mahomes as the quarterback with just one Super Bowl? Like it almost feels like they should have more by now. And this is a good spot for them as well. So I kind of flip-flop on those two thoughts throughout the course of the day. And we'll see where I am by like Thursday, Friday of next week. I think if I had to pick it today, I would give the Eagles uh, a slight edge without feeling overly confident about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Shield, we appreciate it, brother. Are, are you headed out to uh, to Phoenix? Are you going to the game? Uh, I am. I'll be headed out there uh, on Monday for the week. So we'll have our, our podcast, the Ringer's Philly special from there every day. And then we'll be uh, writing stuff for the ringer.com. She'll keep up the good work, oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. And follow that shield Capadia. She'll, we really do appreciate it. Bro. Thanks, Thank bro. You. Appreciate you. All right, guys. Always good talking to you. Take man. care. Yep. Take care, Shield. Uh, interesting insights. He's right, guys. As much as you look at the like matchups, right. And you say offensive line, Eagles, defensive line, Eagles, uh, secondary, Eagles, receivers, especially with Kansas City being banged up, Eagles, right? As, as much as you look at that, there is still that little party that says, ugh, Mahomes. And that's yep. nothing against Hurts, but it's real, man. That dude is a magician. Mahomes and Kelsey. Is, yeah. Because they're the backbreakers, up. Barrett. You got them at, at a third and five, they're getting six. And then they turn around and then yeah. run it back, man. Then he worked that running back in now, so – you, yeah, you, yeah. you cannot overlook the fact that this is supposed to be a reloading, a retooling year for the Kansas City Chiefs. They emerge as the number one seed. They win 14 more games. They've won 16 games now. And as I mentioned yesterday when I went through the numbers, they have three first, second-year players on offense, four or five first, second, third-year players on defense. And here they are, just like the Eagles, one win away from winning a Super Bowl. You can't – I mean, you can say what you want. Yes, on paper, there's no question the Eagles are a superior team. But that scheme that they run there in Kansas City has stood the test of time for the last four years in particular. Yeah. Yeah. They're the third Super Bowl in the last four years. We talk about the rarity of Eagles being in a Super Bowl for the second time in five years. This team's going to the third one in four years. Mm-hmm. And the pieces keep changing. And one of the most explosive pieces in the history of the game in Tyreek Hill was not a part of this. And they're still back again. Yeah. But when you talk about that dude, Mahomes, and that dude, Kelsey, and people, well, if you blank him, everybody says, and it's true, the, the mindset, if you blanket Kelsey, you'll have a measure of success. It's like that old adage, you can't stop him, but you can, you, you only hope to contain him. Yeah. You know? And like I said uh, earlier in the week, early in the season, the dude had seven catches for 25 yards before of him for touchdowns. He's going to find a way to be effective in that offense. They are going to find a way to utilize every asset of him whatsoever. And that's that's what makes it an interesting storyline to build up to this game, especially starting next week. You know, what is Nick Sirianni going to do with this offense? Are they going to blow him out? How does Andy Reid counter? What tricks do they they have up their sleeves? Because you know it's not going to be conventional football from Kansas City's part. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I think it really, I, and Shield touched on it, guys, and we'll talk about it a ton over the next you know week plus. But I just don't know. Can can it, despite Mahomes' magic, can that offensive line hold up? He was magical, Mahomes, a few years ago, and I know yep. that offensive line was really banged up. But yep. that's how they lost that Super Bowl, man. It was relentless pass rush yeah. in, in his face. Yeah, so, bye bye. That and, Patriots team put it on them, bro. Yeah, he did. And, and so what did Andy Reid do? What did that staff do? They ran out and rebuilt that line. They drafted the dude Creed Humphrey for center, an excellent center, and they spent a lot of money in free agency to pick up, to shore up that line. Okay? So they made the necessary adjustments to get back to where they are now, you know. Except for the tackle position. Tackle position, yeah. they're, they're kind of lacking right now. Are they, is it due to injury or 
No, just it's due to this, they're just not as good as they've had before. Yeah. So, mm. I mean, that that's where it's at. I mean, can the Eagles, for me, you know, get to Mahomes, which I think they – no reason to believe they can't, and are gonna, they going to stay committed to the run and pound it down Kansas City's throat, which I think they can make some real hay doing that. That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, those Keep that spots. dude off the field. Control the clock like you did against the 49ers. Keep that dude off the field. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. All right, uh, we'll, we'll continue with the Eagles discussion. It was good stuff from Shield right there. We'll continue with the Eagles discussion uh, when we come back. In a little bit, um, we, we are going to dive into – Barrett's going to give us his offensive game plan against the Chiefs. Uh, we'll get into some NFL stuff, You know, some, some off-the-field issues, some coaching discussions and whatnot. We're going to have Dan Koob join us from Sport Trade at 2.30. Talk about the line movement in this game. Uh, but we come back, Barrett will give us a game plan. A sixer gets snubbed, and we'll take some chat section questions as well. So chat folks, throw a question in, mark in front of what you want to ask us, and we will uh, we'll field some of the best ones when we come back. So don't go anywhere. Derek Gunn, Barrett Brooks, Rob Ellis, Sports Steak, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. Now it's time to tell me tell you about Flynn Tree Services. Yes, Flynn Tree Services is an experienced, licensed, and insured Pennsylvania tree services company that will trim or remove any unwanted trees off of your property. They offer cost-effective solutions to any tree problem that you may face. So if you have any issues in your yard or in your property, they're just a quick phone call away. And they serve southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey, and northern Delaware. Flynn Tree Services specializes in tree removal, stump grinding, as well as tree pruning. Keep in mind, we're in that time of year right now where we get some nasty winds, some bad weather. You want to make sure you get your trees evaluated because those branches, those trees could come down very easily in the wrong kind of weather, heavy winds, etc. Go to their Facebook or Instagram page for a sampling of their work or more information. Give Flynn Tree Services a call at 610-850-2848. 610-850-2848 or online at flynntreeservices.com. That's flynntreeservices.com. Go for the beers. 